Hello everyone. Welcome to Junior's Book Club. I hope you are having a nice day. And today I will be doing a book review about The Outcry in the Barrio by Freddy and Nifa Garcia. And before I dis before I discuss this, when I was uh, many years ago when I was little, I would see this book a lot and personally I didn't know what it was about and Later, later on in my years, I when I started collecting books, I somehow got this book. And personally, I really never thought about it. But when I got it, then the, that's when my uncle decided. To, my uncle was telling me about this book, how nice it was, and how interesting it was. So a month ago, I I decided to read it, and to my surprise, it's one of the best books that I have ever read, and. And um, personally, they were going to make a movie about it, but uh, Freddy, he didn't want them to make it because they were going to twist and add things in it. So it would have been awesome, though. So I am going to begin my book review for this book. Um, it's, about a, it's about Pastor Freddy Garcia, who is a minister of Menanoia Church. And his wife. And the first chapter that I read so far, it says, I want to be me. And the beginning of the book in San Antonio of March 1981, like it says in the book, the 21 gun salute featured the silence of the cemetery. Then came from a distance, came the familiar budge call of tapes, a soldier's farewell to one of his own. And I could no longer hold back my tears. The sixth soldier of the honor guard removed the flag from the coffin and folded it. One of them turned sharply and stepped towards me. Mr. Garcia, on behalf of the President of the United States, the Commander of the Army Forces, and the people of this proud nation, we present this flag as a token of service rendered by your loved one. Here at the beginning of the story, his father had passed away, and he was in the in the army serving World War One, and um, that and from right there on, he was remembering of his past, and he was remembering the 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 September day in in 1944 when he was little, where he used to live in the old barrio with his mother and father and siblings, and. Right here, it talks about his first day of school and and how nervous he was when he was going because he only speaks English. And for being a Mexican-American, he, he expressed himself. When his uh, father had took him to his first day, that he would pick him up later on. And when the teacher had came out, she was talking in English to everyone. And Freddie had no idea what he was saying. Was saying. And he was kind of nervous and scared. And, and the only thing that his fear was that he was afraid that one of his classmates were going to make fun of him. And and one day his teacher was speaking to everyone in the classroom. And Freddie was nervous and he didn't know what she was saying. And she said that teach. She said to everyone if they needed to go to the restroom for them for them to say, "Teacher, may I please go to the restroom?" And Freddie didn't know how to. You know how to say it so throughout the whole day he had to go to the restroom and he was holding it for so long and that fateful day he uh had an accident and the the kids started pointing the finger at him and making fun of him and so forth and um the janitor went to go clean up and the janitor who spoke spanish told him that what he needed to say for him not to worry and then from there on, the teacher had excuse for him to go to to go home and to go change. And he told his mother that he didn't want to go back to school anymore because of what happened and then how he cannot speak. So his mother told him that he, he needs an education, you know, etc. And um, long story short, he was having a lot of trouble in school. That he was having so much trouble. Uh, and one of his grades, one of his teacher had told him, told the, his class that he, they were not allowed to speak Spanish. They were only allowed to speak English. And if they caught them speaking Spanish, they would have to detain them or suspend them or spank them. And, 
and nearly that, he had a hard time. And there was a one, I think it was in fifth grade, I believe, that his, I, I don't know her name, but she was kind of strict. And then one day, Freddie had drawn a, a real mean picture of her on the chalkboard, and he put one of his friend's names. And... Um... His friend had confronted him, like, why did you put his name on there and all this and that, his name on there? And then he said he had to tell the teacher that it was not him. And Freddie was kind of scared, so he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want him to write him out. So Freddie, one day invited him, Freddie went to his house, went to his house and his friend came along with him. So when they were playing, but there was a rope hanging on the patio and Freddie had, you know, put a rope around his neck and started pulling, but his parents caught him in the act and told him that why did he wanted to do that to him? And Freddie told him the truth, but his dad disciplined him and spanked him right there. And um, then later on in the story, there was in the middle of the story, Freddie um, went into the bathroom one day and he put white powder all over his face, his mother's makeup. And his mother screamed at him, like, why are what are you doing? Why are you putting that? And the reason why he was doing that because he wanted to be white like the other kids, an Anglo. And his mother was telling him that he didn't need to do that. He didn't need to be white to be accepted, that he should be happy that that God created him to be the way to be created the way he is. And that it's an honor or something like that. And um, that he should be happy with his Mexican heritage. And, um, and then, um, later on, later on, he struggled throughout his life in school. And, um, Later on in life, he started hanging out with the wrong kids, with the wrong people. And he got into a gang called the Los, Los Patos Locos. And um, he, that's when he started becoming rebellious. And, um, and his father had warned him to stay away from those people who do drugs and all that. But Freddie didn't listen. And... Um, that's when he started hanging around with the wrong crowd and then started doing things that they were not supposed to be doing and so for, so on. So one day when he was hanging out with this gang called Los Patos Locos, he um, was hanging out with them and then one of them saw uh, a black woman dating a, a white man. And, and that woman was there was Yolanda. And she was dating a white man. And I have a description right here. Um, chapter 2. Hey, Carmen, Flaco yelled, put some money in that jukebox. When the rock and roll music filled the Van, Van Nest drugstore, Chicanos from the barrio began dancing up and down the aisles. Stop it, Andy, the owner yelled. You know you... Not supposed to dance in here. No one listened and Andy shook his head. What's the use? I give up. Pancho and I been ignoring the scene. Now we step outside just in time to see Yolanda, a girl from our barrio, walking down the, the street holding hands with an Anglo guy. Hey, Yolanda, we both hollered. You ran out of beans? Uh, my mistake, she wasn't black. She was a uh, Mexican, um, a Mexican-American. She turned with a smirk. Shut up, you Mexicans. Hey, Freddy, check this girl out. Pancho spoke. Loud enough for her to hear. Yolanda is blacker. Yeah, she's a black woman. Um, my mistake, guys. Yolanda is blacker than some of our soul sisters in the barrio. Yet she thinks she's white. Yeah, I teased. She looks like she works at the cleaner's chimney. Ha 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 ha. Everyone around us jeered, but I felt rage rise within me, and I wanted to grab the crocky, grim, crocky gringo and beat him up and teach him in that turncoat Yolanda a lesson. 
right here in the chapter where it says, because Yolanda, I think she was a Mexican-American, but she was a little bit darker. And she was dating an, a white man, and they wanted to beat her up for dating a white man because back in the day, it wasn't right. And, and right here, like it says, I like to... I like to smear her precious white status symbol on the sidewalk and spit on him. I murmured. And Benny and Rudy and Flacco had joined Pancho and me. They had heard my remarks and Rudy spat after Yolanda and her boyfriend as they turned to the corner. Come on, Freddy, cut them loose. They ain't no big thing. Let's go get loaded. I can't talk sleepy and giving me three griffles for a buck. So they were going to go beat them up, but they decided to let them go. So right here, right here throughout the story, that's when they started doing drugs like uh, marijuana and pots. And this is right. And in this story, this is where Freddy was being rebellious and um, hanging out with the wrong crowd. And, um, and that's when he started shoplifting and, you know, doing drugs and all of that. And, um, and right here he was making excuses about eating bologna sandwiches because he wanted to be accepted. And he was ashamed of the lunch that his mom used to make, you know, uh, fuifole, uh, bean tortillas for lunch. And he got permission to go to the store to go buy some bologna sandwiches for school. And, um, so, um. From there on, he, um, him and his friend went to the corner store to go hang out and, you know, do whatever they were going to do. And then they were caught by the cops named Officer Sanchez. And the Officer Sanchez forced, you know, handcuffed him and put him in the, in the, or not handcuffed him, but he put him in the, in his cop car and he drove them to a, a near football field near the high school. And he was trying to teach him a lesson, but that officer was, was kind of being mean to them. So he would hit them with the, with those, um, I don't know what you call those things, but, um, and, um, and, um, excuse me, and, um, Freddie, he got more angrier when that cop was doing that to him. So the cop warned him the first time, and then the second, that's when they were gonna, he was going to teach him a lesson. So those guys, Freddie and his friends, ran away from him. And later on in the story, uh, Freddy was saying that his heroes were Al Capone, Lucky Luciano, Arnold Rosenstern, and John Dillinger, those gangsters. And some people, yeah, and all those characters, because they were gangsters, so they were his idols. And um, later on, they stole... His friends brought a car, a station wagon, a brand new one, but it was stolen. And they were going out for joy riding and and all of that. And then when Freddy took the wheel to learn how to drive, he kind of messed it up for his friends. And that's when five That's when five five um police cars were chasing after them. And they finally got a little bit further, but his friend was saying, every man for himself. So they all had to run away. It's Godaddle. And um, and then later on, after later on throughout the time... All right, chapter three. We were talking about Monkey on My Back. This one, part of the chapter, is about Freddy and Nifa, where he first met Nifa. And uh, right here, I'm going to read right here a little description of what he says here. Um... The loss of my children and my failure as a husband crushed me. I was 23 and lonelier than ever before. My dreams and expe expectations shattered. Trying to forget, I combined drinking and hard liquor and smoking pot and a dropping pill daily. At the restaurant where I worked was Nifa, a fun-loving waitress. She didn't hesitate when I introduced her to, to marijuana. <laughs> Under the influence of pot, she was easily persuaded to spend the night with me. Even, even when I explain my terms, I want you to understand what you're getting, what you're getting into. I'm still hurting over my first marriage and I 
never intend to get married again. So if you're getting any ideas about that, forget it. We can keep house, play house, but marriage is out. I'm game. Um, Freddy, she agreed. I'll be satisfied just being with you. Her brown eyes look sincere. She looks stood to tiptoe to place her hands against my cheeks. I'll never leave you unless you ask me to. I didn't believe her, but a few days later we moved in together. And from there on, that's when she, she was under the influence of drugs, of marijuana, by him. And, uh, and right here, Nifa's attention help, helped ease my loneliness, but nothing could really take away the pain of separation from my children. Hoping to gain custody of them, I consult a lawyer and he explained how the law favors the mother in such cases. And I left his, his office heartbroken. Right here, this is where he tried to gain custody with his children. But back in the day, the court was more favored with the, with the mother than with the father. And he was heartbroken because he couldn't get his kids with the custody. And Nifa's uh, attention and her company brought a little ease to him. But the only thing that could not take away was the pain of his children. And... And um, later on, that's when him and Nifa were getting in the influence of drugs, pot, pills, and marijuana. And they got pregnant with their, they, she got pregnant with her with their first child. Um, as I think it was um, I don't remember the name of that child, but um. I can't remember the, the child's name. Josie. Yeah. Their first child was named was Josie. And from there on, that's when Freddy was going to use the needle. And that's when Nifa was kind of like hesitate for him not to do it. And right here in the chapter, that's when he was going to go see his friend Benny from the bar. And, um... The, um, he wanted to get fixed just to make himself feel better. And then that's when he tied the, the leather thing on his arm to put the needle, to inject the needle. And and Nifa was kind of scared about that. And right here it says, Nifa had remind... Nifa was very hesitant about the needle that he was doing. And right here it says, Nifa remained silent. But when she saw I was really serious, she pleaded, please, Freddy, don't. And right here, Freddy was rude to her. Shut up and leave me alone. I don't know what I'm doing. I pushed her away. The needle hurt as soon as I felt the sensation of drowsiness. The next thing I knew, I was vomiting. And right here, his friend assured him, Don't worry about it, Freddy, Benny slurred. I vomit my first time, too. And right here, that's when he started yeah, getting addicted to the needle, the drugs. In the beginning, I fixed only once a month, then it became weekly, and then within six months, I was fixing two times a day. One afternoon, Nita and I were in the hot corner backyard having a few beers. Mario and Benny had just scored with in the bathroom fixing. So that in the backyard, that's when they were drinking beer and relaxing, and that's when their friends were in the back in the restroom doing their drugs. And here it says, sure, sure hope they leave some for me. I told Eva maybe it'll help my flu. My entire body had been aching all day and I felt very weak. My eyes were watery and I was getting cold chills. Just then, Benny stuck his head out of the bathroom door. Hey, Freddy, you want a taste? Sure, man. I grabbed my belt and tightened it around my arm. As I walked towards them, as soon as the heroin started flowing through my veins, I was flu symptom disappeared. I didn't even want to admit, but I was really hooked. And from there on, from the needles, he was getting hooked later on. And this is when I think Mifa was... I don't think Mifa was starting to do it, but... Um, Mifa was getting worried about uh, Freddy's um, habits. And during the time, I think she was pregnant with her second child. And... Um,
Long story short, this is when his dad confronted him about the drugs because his sister Santos had saw him, you know, being loaded and, and stoned. And his father, no, his mother had confronted him and he had lied to his mother about the drugs that he was doing. And he denied it. And so on. So on and so forth. And this is when uh, Nifa and Freddy were having a lot of drama. Um, throughout the story, they were homeless. Sometimes they would sleep in an abandoned house. And this is when she was pregnant, I think, with Josie. And during that time, um, during that time, there was a lot of drama between the two. And um, there were some times that he would, you know, go to his parents' house and lay on the, on the sofa. And later on, it, things got out of control from there on. And he suddenly realized how did he get so low to be where he is right where he was and then finally he um finally Nifa and him got a house together and still they were still struggling and he went to uh a, um he went to a psychiatric a psychiatric hospital and the the rehab to help him i think he went to five different rehabs and different doctors but he was cured, but then a month later, he went back to doing what he was doing again. And um, and Nifa was getting worried about it, and she was getting tired of it, too. And then finally, his mother suggested that they go to Los Angeles to be with his two sisters, Estrella and... Um, and um, I don't remember the names, but but before I get to that... This is when this is what happened when he got home to Nifa. One evening I got super stoned and she confronted me. You know, Freddy, even your own family says I'm a fool for backing you up. I really thought that my love would be enough to change you. Now I know it's not. You haven't changed one single bit and I'm getting tired. We're doing all right, I grumbled. Quit nagging and leave me alone. Her eyes flashed in anger. Do you know what Josie and I ate today? Cheerios. No milk, no sugar, just dry Cheerios. Look around you, Freddy. Days go by when we can't even afford to buy a loaf of bread or a bag of beans. And you dare to tell me we're doing all right? Esta loco. She fought to hold back her tears. And, and have you looked at yourself lately? The least little scratch of bumps you get develop into big pus pockets you you're running alive you're running alive and you're doing nothing about it man freddy it's not all right and this is where uh nifa was conf confronting him about what's going on and during that time she was getting so frustrated with him that she was yeah getting tired and freddy was getting tired of her nagging like he would say a few times in this book and and this is when right here it says that I sat down on my small couch and warned her. Stop your nagging, Nifa. And I tried the whole bit. Just shut up. Suddenly I start trembling uncomfortably, my teeth chattering, and I climb up on the couch under our blanket. Come lie down beside me, I pleaded. I'm freezing. Touch my forehead. Nifa cried out. You're burning up with fever, Freddy. Your eyes keep rolling back. You could go into... I don't know that uh, concludes. You need to see a doctor. Forgive it, I shivered. Just keep me warm. I'll be all right in the morning. We had in the newspaper. And right here, this is when he was reading about, about the drug addicts. We read in the newspaper about addicts dying from heroin accidentally mixed with rat poison. And now Nifa was afraid I have to become another victim. I really didn't care if I was dying. My life had turned to nothing, and those I loved I ended up hurting. For, for a junkie like me, we were only three way out. The penitentiary, the insane asylum, or the city morgue. If this poison and, and it kills me, I thought it would do me a favor. This is when he stooped so low that he lost hope. And the five doctors that helped him didn't do no good. Even the penitentiaries and the 
rehab didn't do any good. Once he got out of there for a month, he was going back to his habits again. And um, and later on in his life, he was he stooped so low that he didn't know what to do. And then later, this is what his mom told him for him to go to Los Angeles to, um, you know, to get some help. And he did. He went on the bus to Los Angeles to be with his sisters. And then this is when, and this is when he ran into his old friends from San, from San Antonio, who used to be a junkie. And um, and he told him that he was a Christian, that he was no longer a junkie. And Freddie thought he was crazy. And then he gave him a pamphlet called the Teen Challenge. It's a it's a facility where the where all the drug addicts and junkies go to get cured. And when he and when his friend had told him that he that God had changed his life, and Freddie was very skeptical about it, like it was all like a joke or something. And Freddie went to go over there to go check it out himself. And. Um, And right here in chapter four, born again, and I'll read you right here. Alfredo, which is Freddy, and I had both been patients at the Fort Wood Hospital for drug addiction for drug addictions. Now a year and a half later I recognized him as he stood at the corner of the third and Broadway. He was well dressed as I figured he had been to be pushing drugs. Freddy, he greeted me as I walked up to him. What y'all doing in Los Angeles? I came to kick, but you know how it is. I struggled. How about you? Are you holding? I I need a fix. Bad, man. He put his arm around me and he led me aside. And I got something better, Freddy. I got Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, man. I cut him off, but have you seen anybody with some stuff? I'm sick. A big grin broke across his face. I am not a junkie no more, Freddy. I haven't used drugs for over a year. Jesus Christ, Jesus changed my life. I never seen a cure addicted in all my years in the streets. I thought to myself, who's this guy trying to kid? Hiding me a card, handing me a card, Alfredo looked at, looked at me in the eyes. He's were clear and unwavering, put in his pocket, Freddy. If you need help, you can reach me at Team Challenge. I stared at him, not knowing if, if, if he were serious or joking. Right here, this is when Freddy was kind of like, is he serious? Are you joking? But no, he was being serious. So Freddy was kind of hesitant to go to this facility. And um, and this is when he was thinking about going. But he was thinking about all the failures and all the things that he was going through. Alrighty, um... And this is when he was going into the facility in Teen Challenge, and um, it was a, it was a place that Freddie didn't expect to be. It was not like one of those facilities with those huge hospital places, but this was more like a regular two-story house, where all the addicts were going, and a lot of people were getting cured. And he decided to go, but he was more hesitant. But he decided to go, and he was more rude to the, to one of the brothers there who were. Christians and he was okay um, this is when he was having a lot of trouble you know fitting into this facility but um, one of the brothers were talking to, were talking about the gospel with him that that it, it changed their life that God can change him and he won't be an addict no more and Freddie was very hesitant about it but then one day that he went to the chapel it kind of you know, woke him up, but he almost left, and one of the 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 deacons almost stopped him, and um, and finally he went back, and then this is when he gave his life to Christ, and then that's when he became a different person, and um, and the book here that when the service was over, he went outside to the backyard, and he was seeing the roses. And he was realizing that how come he didn't never recognize this before? He was recognizing the beauty of these flowers, the smell, everything. That's when his you know his eyes were opened. And later, that's when he called Nifa, but Nifa was kind of not believing him, and she, you know, that's what she was telling him. When are you coming home? And then, 
And then he said that he can't come home because him and him and Nifa were not married, and Nifa was kind of like, "Are you kidding me?" And then that's when yeah, that's when Nifa decided to go to the to the church or that facility. And then, long story short, that's when she gave her life to Christ. And then there was a pastor who was going to marry them there, but marry them at the house, a private ceremony. But then he decided to marry them there in front of the witness. And one of the brothers of the church vol quickly volunteered to be his best man. And one of them volunteered to give Nifa away at the wedding. And that's where Nifa and Freddie got married in Los Angeles. And... um And later on, that's when life was different. And chapter 5, A New Life. This is when he, um, this is when he decided to go to, this is where he re-enlisted in Bible school. And this is where he wanted to learn about the Word of God in the ministry. He, the only thing that was kind of holding him back is to learn how to read and write. I mean, no, I actually learned how to read, but he got that right. He got, I mean, excuse me, he got that. And that's when he, that's when he returned to San Antonio to talk to the, to the drug addicts, the people that he would know. And, um... And right here in the book, that's when he was giving pamphlets to the junkies and the drug dealers, and that's when you know, later on, that's when life was getting a lot better. And later, that's when Nifa and him bought their first house. And later on, he started a little ministry called the Victory Temple. And he was getting members little by little who were, who were drug addicts. But then later, they gave their life to Christ. And then, they, then later, excuse me, they gave their life to Christ. And then later, they were changed. And um, they brought in some people, some junkies, into their home, uh, their small house. And then that's when they started ministering to them, men and women, young and old. And then, um, and then um, later, that's when the it was it was kind of getting overcrowded in there. And that's when. Um, Um, that's when you know that's when Freddie decided to um, rent a new uh, rent a new house but then that's when he was driving around with his wife and then they finally found one it was a small broken down blue house with a big with a huge land there and there were some junk cars in the back and he decided to tell him and the members to go help him and to go fix it up and, and that's when, you know, so Nifa agreed to minister to the young women and Freddie decided to go minister to the young men in the other rental house. So men and women were separated. And later on and so forth, <clears throat> they were staying there in that little house. And right here on chapter, and that was, a, that was chapter six. And on chapter 7, The Wild Bunch, a whistle followed by the pounding on the door startled me from the upper table. Hey, Freddy, cried a voice. February cold and windy evening. The dark and early, I pulled the curtains aside and peeled out the window. Que quieres? Who is it? It is me, Joe Zerke. I opened the door and he shuttled his stumble aside and the Nick, cats, Nick pants and chatter jacket hanging loose on his tall frame making him look wasted and older than he's 21 years old. I'm hooked bad Freddy. He was uptight and shaky. I use heroin every day and I came to see if you could let me kick in your home. Sure Joe. I closed the door behind him. You came to the right place. And this is where he said that God was going to help him. Jesus can help you kick. Man, you don't understand, he shivered. I'm gonna get sick. Look at me. I'm getting cold and chills already. I understand, Joe. I pulled up my sleeve and pointed to my 
only those scars. But I also know that Jesus has the power to give you victory over your drug addiction. Nita and I prayed and we felt and um, they prayed for him and, and he was completely calm, the man. After a week, his physical withdrawals from heroin was completely and I stared, I started teaching him from the Bible. Drugs ain't never been your problem, Joe. Sin is your problem. It says here in the Bible, for all who have sinned have come short of the glory of God. And they were ministering to him, and then I think he was delivered from there. And um, and then one day they were having a ministry there at the church. They were worshiping God, and you know all the drug all the drug addicts were being delivered. And then one day, um, one faithful day on that day. Um, they just got, and I'm going to read it right here. Just then, there was a knock on the door. Nitha opened it, and a police officer stood outside looking concerned. Ma'am, we got a disturbing call that there was a fight going on. Nitha smiled. No, no one's fighting, officer. We're just praying, singing, and, and, God, and praising God. You can come in and take a look. And the officer, the officer smiled. You go ahead and keep doing what you're doing. We just came to come calmly with the call. He turned around and left, and we stopped our worship long enough to have supper, then spend the evening in Bible study. And during that time, they were having the worship service and all of that around. And um, everything seems to be going great. And that is the end of chapter 7 that I was reviewing. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse. And chapter 8 right here. Let me see. Um, on chapter 8, um, Victory Home, that's when they're, he was building his ministry. Addicts come coming in and the need for a larger home became urgent. Daily we prayed and searched for a place. When I found a two-bedroom home for rent with an option to buy only a mile and a half away, I really got excited, and this is where the this is where uh, Freddie got the sm the small blue house, and it was a two bedroom, and um, and right here he got excited, and he, it says right here on the chapter, um, I took Nifa to see to to see it. Weeds grew tall all around the house. Inside it was a mass, and the globes of split it with strain in the walls and the floor. While we were there, a couple of scorpions and a few spiders curled past our feet. Nifa squirm. The backyard must be the neighborhood dump, she murmured. Look at those junk cars. That was no problem, I assured her. We cleaned it up a little time. What I was about this property that it got two acres of land. Our guys can get out of breath. We decided to rent and pray that if God wanted to buy this house, we would provide money to buy it with borrowed broom, mops, and pails and scraped scrubs and clean outside amongst the weeds of the backyard. And right here, this is when the the members of this is when one of his members of the of his little Bible one of the little this is when one, one this is when one of the members were helping him with this new house. And they were cleaning, cutting the grass, fixing the house up, everything. And this is where the, all the men were gathered together to for Bible study and deliverance from drug addiction. And and um long story short, uh throughout the story, uh this is when he was building a new church, a victory temple. This is when he started to be known. And this is when the, this is when Nifa was kind of spec, spectacle about being the pastor's wife. Like she had no, she didn't know anything about being a pastor's wife. And and um, the pastora's wife. And um, here, let me see. Uh,
And this is when um, the Victory Temple, this is what his ministries, he was sending one of his members who were giving his life to Christ. And he would send them out to minister to people, to the drug addicts and all that. And there was this one person that was trying to mess it up. And he told one of them from in, in El Paso, Texas. But he told, he really had told Freddy that that was his ministry, that he'll do whatever he want. And then less than a month later, there was a lot of trouble going around in his ministry. And, and from there on, he had, Freddy had never heard from that man ever again. So... Freddie had to be firm to be careful to make sure that everything was fine. And um So he had to make sure to be careful who to make sure that they were not doing things that were not supposed to be doing and and in chapter ten it's called Battle Scars. So he was being more um cautious with his members not doing something they were not supposed to be doing so they would some of them will go across san antonio to preach the word of god and he would send people to different places in texas and um long story short um um let me just skip a, some of the chapters in here And there was a little drama going around in the story. Um, when Freddie when Freddie had his church, one of the members were going to go against him. And he was convincing one of his own members to go against Freddie for him not to be the pastor of the church anymore. That member wanted to be the pastor. He wanted to take over his church, his work, everything. And, um, and all of them, mostly the whole church was against him. Half of the church was. And Gilbert was kind of convinced, one of his members. But then Gilbert went over to Freddy and Nifa's house to go tell him what was going to happen, what was really happening. And Freddy got the news, so he confronted this certain individual in person, what he was doing and then why he was doing it. And then that's when he confronted the church, that how they felt about it. But if they didn't like it, for them to leave. And sadly, he lost all of his members because of that one person who wanted to go against him. And Freddie did, and he lost a lot of members in that church. So, but then later on, more people were coming. And, and later on throughout the story, um, that's when he needed a church. And um, I think I found it right here. He found a an old he found an old he found a church near town. It was an old Baptist church. It was bricked. And it was for sale and Freddie got excited and I think he got excited and he wanted to buy it. So he went to go take a look and all of that and um it's right here. Our congregation was already too already too large for our storefront church. I already I had found an old Methodist church on Buena Vista Street for sale, but they were asking the generic amount of ten thousand dollar cash. Common sense told me that it couldn't be done, but I knew in my heart this was the church God wanted to give us. When our people heard, they responded to the to the challenge. Every got involved. The men and the teenagers. Hold car washes, children sold candy, cookies, the women hold bake sales, some tam sold tamales and arts. And crabs organized the exhibition to the street selling raspas and um, and snow cones in the barrio. And after they were doing all of this, and right here Three major TV stations gave its coverage. The entire city of San Antonio responded. We even received money through the mail from beer joints. Their customers had been used on the TV, passed the hat around, and sent their donations. 
early in the new year we are able to purchase our new Victory Temple. God has provided over $77,000 cash and Christians and Christian businessmen signed the preventionary note to cover our $23,000 loan. No one but Jesus, no one but Jesus could have moved some of our city's most provincial business leaders to come back up a bunch of ex-drugs and addicts. And from right there on, that's when, um, that's when he got his new church. And that church is still, is still active today. And it's called the Menanoia Church. That's where Freddie was a pastor. And um, my uncle used to go. My uncle used to go there at the church, and I remember passing that church many times. And um, long story short, they got their new church, the new ministry. They were heard worldwide, and David Wilkerson, Pastor David Wilkerson, invited Freddie to go on his go to go with him on his crusades, and then Freddie actually went to, to go preach in the crusades. And he was very, he was known worldwide. I believe he was known worldwide in San Antonio. And um, he uh, made a lot of difference. He saved a lot of lives through God's help. And um, through God's help, he saved a lot of people from drug addictions. And there were some people who didn't want to be changed. They wanted to stay with their lifestyle. I have to cut this video short, guys. But I'm going to give my review about the story, about this novel. I don't want to give a spoiler about the ending, so. What I felt about this book, I really did like this book, guys. This was one of, this became one of my favorite books. It's one of the best stories I have read. With all of the 12 novels I have read in one year, this is one of the best novels I've read. And it's a really nice story. It was a wonderful testimony that he gave to, to the people in need. And personally, there was going there was going to be a movie about this book, but due to the the changes that the, the Hollywood wanted to do, Freddie Freddie didn't want to do it because they were going to twist and add things into the story, and Freddie didn't want that. And um, personally, if there was a movie, I would have loved to see it. And um, and um. I really like this book. This is one of the best books I have read so far. And personally, I would have liked to have met Freddy Garcia, but sadly, he had passed away 12 years ago, uh, I think due to natural causes. And um, today, his church that he bought, the Old Baptist Church, today is, is still active. It is called Menanoia Church. His son... Uh, Joel is the pastor of the church, and his wife Nifa is is present today. And I have seen him on YouTube. And um, it would have been a great honor to have meet Freddie. And this has been one of the best books I have read so far. Alrighty, guys, I'm gonna. Guys, if you really like this channel, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos. If you want to be a part of my book club on Facebook, follow the link below under the video. And it's called Junior's Book Club. And you're more than welcome to join. So if you really want to participate in my book club, follow the link below and I will. I will be more than happy to have you on my, my book club. So, thanks for, thanks for watching guys, I hope you have a wonderful day.